Good morning, grace and peace to you from the one who was and is and is to come. Amen. We all look and long for transforming our lives in one way or another. And we know that the transformation of our society always has to begin with ourselves. Some of us might even be able to pinpoint a particular moment of spiritual conversion, which gave our lives a completely new direction and orientation. Conversion and transformation are big words, and they are not only used within the religious realm. We find the need and desire for conversion also in the natural sciences. A radical new perspective is described as a paradigm shift. When it comes to economic and ecological transformation, we're urged to turn away from the capitalist illusion of endless growth. Pacifists try to convince us that violence will only beget violence and hope for radical conversion. Feminists keep reminding us of the destructive nature of patriarchy and the need for a new exodus. And therapists hope that a trusting relationship with their clients will assist them in the process of a lifelong transformation that will allow them to overcome addictions and compulsions, past hurts and self-hatred. The desire and need for conversion and transformation shows up in different ways. Some call for greater patience, others insist that if not now, then when. It is important to pause for a moment and be aware to what extent our present climate is dominated by a secular and religious rhetoric that emphasizes the need for conversion and transformation. One of the most dramatic conversion stories in our scriptures can be found in the Acts of the Apostles and takes us to the famous road to Damascus. We still refer to dramatic events that have changed our lives as Damascus experiences. Can Paul's conversion add anything to the present debate on transformation? An initial answer could be, there's clearly hope also for religious, violent fanatics. But what a radical intervention from above it took. For it happened at a time when Paul felt no need for conversion or transformation. He was rather happy with himself. Paul belonged to the movement of the Pharisees who were rigorous in their observances of the law and the protection of Jewish identity. Any violation of the law ran the risk of delaying God's promises return. Paul was driven by a fierce desire for Israel's purity and determined to use violence if necessary. According to the law, anyone hanged on a tree was under God's curse. So how can the crucified Jesus be the Jewish Messiah? It was such a mockery of his faith. Jesus' followers had to be stopped from preaching such a provocation. Paul expected a powerful and violent Messiah who would liberate Israel from the pagan yoke of Roman oppression. But all this would change with his trip to Damascus. Paul's conversion is described in great detail in Acts, but Paul himself also refers to it in his own letters. How do these different accounts speak to each other? Acts presents us with a third-person account, while Paul's letters give us autobiographical glimpses of the event. Caravaggio's two very different paintings on the same event, to a certain extent, capture the different perspectives of Acts and Paul's letters. While the one painting presents us with a dramatic and disturbing disruption of the mundane, the other breathes a strange, peaceful stillness. It is one and the same event, but two very different interpretations. The author of Acts mentions the story three times. Initially, it is part of his own storytelling. Later, it is referred to twice in speeches attributed to Paul. Acts chapter 9 presents us with the fullest account of the story and puts Paul's conversion into context for us. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, where the men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. It is Paul's idea and initiative. He approaches his religious superiors to send him to the synagogues of Damascus in Syria in order to arrest those who belong to the way. 
Jesus' first followers were not called Christians, but people of the way. But Paul's journey to Damascus is interrupted by an encounter with the risen Christ. As Paul was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It was Willem James in his book, The Varieties of Religious Experience, who identified illumination is one aspect of mystical experiences. Such illumination often involves an experience of light, seeing light or being of light, a being of light. In fact, for some, the whole world is seen to become radiant and full of light. But such illumination often also includes a sense of enlightenment. To be enlightened is to suddenly see more clearly than ever before, to see the way things are. Such seeing leads not only to an ex ecstatic feeling, but also to a strong sense of knowing the world differently. Such illumination marks a radical perceptual shift, which is not limited to the actual experience of enlightenment, but continues to shape one's vision afterward. The popular hymn Amazing Grace sings about such illumination. I once was blind, but now I see. In Paul's case, such blindness became a physical experience which forced him to see things differently. There's a light from heaven that blinds him, followed by a voice asking him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Paul addresses the light, the voice is Lord, and then asks, who are you? It becomes clear that Paul does not see a visual figure at that moment, but simply a light which then also identifies itself by announcing, I am Jesus. Since Jesus had been dead for at least a few years by now, Paul must have encountered the risen Christ in his mystical experience. The risen Christ instructs him to get up and go into the city where he will be told what he must do. As Paul gets up from the ground, he opens his eyes and realizes that he can no longer see. Those witnessing the event cannot see anyone, but only hear the sound and are left speechless. So they take him by the hand into Damascus. We're told that Paul was blind for three days. He did neither eat nor drink anything. During this time, a disciple of Christ by the name of Ananias, residing in Damascus, is tasked in a vision by God to visit Paul and pray for him. An intense exchange unfolds between God and Ananias. It needs a lot of convincing for Ananias to follow God's instructions. We realize that Ananias was well informed about this man from Tarsus named Saul. But God says to him, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. It is through Ananias' vision that we hear about Paul's divine calling to become an apostle to the Gentiles. Paul himself is prepared for Ananias' visit for yet another vision. It takes prayer and the placing of hands for Saul to see again and to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He is immediately baptized. The road to Damascus marks Paul's conversion. But in their book, the first Paul, Marcus Book and John Crossan highlight that it is neither a conversion from being non-religious to being religious, nor from one religion to another, but rather a conversion within one and the same religious tradition. Already before his conversion, Paul was filled with religious passion. But Paul does not become a Christian, so to speak, but a Jewish follower of Christ. At this point, Christianity was not yet a religion separate from Judaism. And for the rest of his life, Paul would always consider himself a Jew. In other words, we need to understand his conversion is one within Judaism, from one way of being Jewish to another way of being Jewish, from being a Pharisee Jew to being a Christian Jew. His Damascus experience laid the foundation for his vocation as an apostle to the Gentiles. It marked the beginning of a call that echoes the call stories of the great Jewish prophets. But his call has to be understood within the matrix of the Roman Empire, to which he responded with the proclamation of Jesus as Lord, the one whom Roman imperial authority crucified. 
in collaboration with Jewish high priestly authority, was vindicated by God, raised from the dead. The central question for Paul was now, who is Lord, Jesus or empire? Paul's transformation led to him being fiercely opposed to Rome's imperial vision and advocating Jesus' nonviolent resistance to the forces and powers of death in the world. Paul no longer promoted violence but preached peace. He no longer inspired religious hatred but a love that transcended the divisions created by Rome's patriarchy, slavery and violent victories, but also the divisions between Jews and Gentiles. Caravaggio's first painting of the story captures, to speak with Helen Langdon, the sense of crisis and dislocation in which Christ disrupts the mundane world. The rearing horse and alarmed soldier are customary motives. A light floods over Saul's body. Caravaggio makes use of his artistic freedom to picture Jesus, whose extended arms and open hands almost besiege Paul, underlying his question to him, Soul, soul, why do you persecute me? In that way, this dramatic and terrifying intervention from above is balanced by an unexpected tenderness and warmth. But an angel is holding Christ back from getting too close as if to remind Christ that this is soul he's reaching out to, the one who set out to persecute and kill his followers. But the sweet sound of amazing grace is not lost to Caravaggio, despite a terrified Paul. The seven letters that Paul would later write to the various congregations confirm the account in the Acts of the Apostles. It was his experience of Jesus as a living reality which led to his conversion, but his own letters bring a different perspective to the event. One of the most fascinating passages referring to his experiences of the risen Christ can be found in his letter to the Corinthians, which might be a combination of several letters. I must go on boasting, although there is nothing to be gained. I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know. But God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. With entering the third heaven and paradise, Paul refers to a mystical experience that allowed him to dwell in another level of reality and to hear things that are beyond words. In the same letter, he explicitly uses the language of mysticism. And all of us, with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. Again, mystical language is employed to describe an experience of transformation through unveiled faces and seeing the glory of the Lord. Such transformation is the result of his post-Easter encounter with the risen Christ. 
Both in Cross and therefore speak of Paul as a Jewish Christ mystic. His experiences allowed him to see Judaism anew in the light of Jesus. But what do Borg and Crossan mean by Paul being a mystic? They define a mystic in broad terms as someone living in union or communion with God. The first involves a sense of oneness with God. The second, a sense of connection with the sacred that is deep, close and intimate, even though a sense of two-ness remains. Mystical experiences are described by them as ecstatic experiences in which there is a vivid sense of the presence of God, or the sacred, or the real. An ecstatic experience is about a non-ordinary state of consciousness, where one is out of or beyond ordinary consciousness. It allows one to dwell in an overwhelming sense of God's presence. The encounter with God becomes an experiential reality, a different way of knowing God, which is more than believing in God. It involves a vivid sense of union and illumination. And therefore, whenever Paul speaks about being in Christ, which is over a hundred times in his genuine letters, he is using mystical language in the same way that he speaks about Christ being in him. To have faith for Paul, it's therefore not simply about holding something to be true, agreeing that certain statements of faith are true, but about experiencing a transforming union with Christ, a dwelling in Christ. Paul's letters cannot therefore be reduced to a set of ideas that need to be systematized and explained. His theology is the result of a profound mystical experience. It is along those lines that already the New Testament scholar Adolf Gustav Deismann argued, whoever takes away the mystical element from Paul, the man of antiquity, sins against the Pauline word, quench not the spirit. Caravaggio's second attempt at painting Paul's conversion certainly does not quench the spirit. It presents us with a serene scene in which Paul lies on the ground, flat on his back, a defenseless and vulnerable warrior, with hands no longer held over his face in terror, but with arms stretched out in a gesture of welcoming and embracing the gift of divine light flooding his body. There is no sense of humiliation or wounded pride. Caravaggio now dwells more intensely on the spiritual transformation Paul is experiencing in his encounter with the living Christ, using the light to direct our attention. This is underlined by Paul's horse standing tall, filling two-thirds of the canvas, not frightened or startled, but rather cautious and watchful, careful not to harm Paul, its front right hoof, raised and twisted, making eye contact with Paul. In fact, the horse's race too forms the center of the painting. Does the horse, known for its strong will and immense power, become a kind of metaphor for the power of God, overwhelming but careful not to cause any injury on the fallen Paul? The horse radiates gentleness and compassion, symbolizing a divine power which may disrupt our lives but not to crush us, but to gift us with new light and life. Caravaggio captures a significant moment in time, Paul's realization that there is nothing and no one to fear or persecute. His facial expression is serene. The composition presents us with a mysterious silence and stillness. According to James Finley, the mystic is the one who says, Look at what love has done to me. There is nothing left but the being of love itself, giving itself away as the concreteness of who you simply are. With his conversion and transformation, the Apostle Paul experienced the divine love of the risen Christ. This encounter shaped his ministry, which was no longer about earning the love, but returning the love. Such is the language not of fear, but of ecstasy. We are encouraged to think of Paul's ministry as an invitation to such divine intimacy. In closing, one needs to highlight that Paul's conversion and transformation reveal a few striking features that go against our common perception of who needs to be converted. 
Paul's conversion is first of all one from thinking he is complete and perfect to realizing how incomplete and imperfect he is. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more, circumcised on the eighth day, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness, based on the law, faultless. There was no discontent and no lack of confidence before his conversion. There was no sense that he needed to change anything. He was settled in his ways and proud of what he was teaching and doing. There was no sense of not being good enough or being a failure. It was only after his conversion that he realized that he had completely missed the mark. A new restlessness entered his life. But whatever gain, whatever we were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. And secondly, Paul's conversion is also not about someone who suffered as victim and finally learned to stand up for himself, raise his voice and assert himself. His conversion follows a different script. He was not the hunted, but the hunter. He belonged to the wolves and not the lambs. He persecuted the first Christians. But with his conversion, he sought to be in relationship and community with the victims, seeking communion with Christ's suffering. For it is there that he felt a much greater power at work, the power that could raise the dead to new life, that could transform persecutors into those who identified with the victims. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings. These, then, are the two striking features of Paul's conversion from perfection to imperfection, from persecutor to persecuted. There is hope, then, for the seemingly perfect, the divisive fundamentalists, the zealous purists, the violent fanatics. But at the heart of Paul's conversion, from perfection to imperfection, from persecutor to persecuted, lies his experience of being recognized and accepted by God without any condition. He no longer felt the need to be righteous to prove himself before God. He no longer needed people's recognition and praise. All that mattered now was to gain Christ and be found in him. One can speculate if Saul adopted his Roman name Paul in order to become all things to all people as he became the apostle of the Gentiles. He might have also given up his Hebrew name Saul because of its regal connotations. The Roman name Paul means little or small and would have given expression to his desire to make himself small enough for the light and love of Christ to shine even brighter and stronger through him. Caravaggio's two paintings, each in their own way, captures important aspects of Paul's conversion and transformation, as described in Acts and in Paul's own letters. They invite us to pause and meditate on the one willing to disrupt our lives in order to show us a love that does not want to be earned but received. And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Grace that taught my heart 
to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first Must you?